Did you write all this down? I, I wrote down uh, on interaction analogies. I wrote it as if for a, a serious paper, uh, thinking, well, there are these four interactions in physics. Four. Four. Uh, and so could I think of uh, four social interactions? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I had very little understanding of anything social. But I was, uh, this, this was my way in to consider uh, sociology or... Uh, social interaction. And so uh, certainly there were different types of social interactions. Uh, and so I found a classification of four social interactions, uh, which could be uh, modelled on or considered analogous to the, the famous physical interactions. And they were um, economic interaction, which mm -hmm. is the weakest, yeah. which is like gravity. But economic interaction is not only going out and buying lemons in a shop and therefore handing over money and so on. But um, all the uh, productive activity of uh, working together, exchanging, yeah. uh, and so what we can generally consider e economics. And it's very weak at a personal level and individual level. It doesn't change very much between us if I'm buying something from you or if I'm working for... Okay. Uh, whereas, as an aggregate, it has very strong implications for the structure of society, the classes and so on. Of course, I, I hadn't got to the stage of thinking in terms of the class system and, and whatever, but that took me towards it. So uh, I wasn't really interested in that, mm. but I, I wanted something which corresponded with the weakest interaction, which is gravity, which was rather special. It was mm. rather, mm. Um, it shapes space and time, basically. Mm. Uh, uh, Einstein and uh, relativity and so on is concerned with gravitational interaction, which uh, necessarily leads you to consider what you mean by space and time yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the economic interaction would be in some way uh, analogous to that. Uh, and then I enjoyed myself with the electromagnetic uh, interaction because that would be sexual, mm. uh, plus and minus, uh, positive and negative. Uh, so basically, sexual interactions, the um, uh, fact of being male and female, that's the way I looked at it at the time. But there was certainly sexual interaction, uh, generally speaking, um, considering the family, uh, because, you know, uh, father, mother, uh, and so on, uh, was much stronger uh, than uh, economic interaction, much more uh, personally um, uh, significant. Yeah, I'm saying I'm saying this quite quickly because I don't want to go into the details too much, and in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but it was very important to me at the mm -hmm. time, and so we had the um, economic interaction, sexual interaction, which I say like that to uh, simplify things, because there was this question: okay, if there was Dan and Sharon and Rosemary, uh, would it be different if we were all three male or all three female mm -hmm. or two male? And uh, are the way that we're talking mm -hmm. together? Is there any influence the fact that um, uh, the, the, the sexual aspect, if you like, uh, do we relate to each other in different ways? Because mm. the other stronger forces were the ones that interested me, the nuclear forces, obviously, strong nuclear and weak nuclear. Mm. Well, let's go straight to the straight, strong nuclear, because obviously uh, the weak nuclear uh, interaction was anyway rather strange and uh, special, if you remember. But the strong nuclear action is, is uh, very clear. It's called strong because it mm. uh, has the, the, the most uh, energy involved and um, holds nucleuses together and is what's responsible for the energy of the sun and the stars and, 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 and so on. And so I was interested in that. What does that physical interaction correspond to in society mm. as a good philosopher? Philosophic interaction, mm. uh, uh, I, uh, talking about ideas. Uh, yeah. exchanging yeah. ideas, oh, okay. so that the, the power of communication yeah. of ideas, this is strongly human capacity mm. to um, say, yes, I understand, like you're doing mm. now, you know, mm. uh, exchanging thoughts and um, 
when it comes down to it, uh, philosophies, you know, there's the, the, the very idea of uh, seeing the flash of light on the road to Damascus, you know, the uh, religious conversion, mm. uh, the, the, the fact that people are, have their whole lives motivated by believing in something, whether it be uh, God or nature or, um, or who knows what. Um, it was, from my point of view, the strongest interaction at a, 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 an individual level, which changes lives and, uh, in a sense, um, ex uh, explains um, social structures in a, in a very deep way. Uh, and the, the, this analogy got more and more involved. Uh, because it's not just a question of identifying the forces, but the structures. Mm. And so the weak nuclear interaction was somewhere in between the sexual, sociological uh, interaction and the strong nuclear, so therefore cultural, basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. interaction through uh, works of art, mm. through literature mm. Mm. and so on, which is a uh, midway between um, emotions, mm. the what are generally mm. psychological, sexual uh, mm. uh, type in interactions. Um, and the strong philosophical. So anyway, I had my classification, which was obviously forced. And the, 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 the obvious question is, well, does that really explain anything? Yeah. And uh, yes and no, because the uh, four physical interactions don't really explain a uh, particular phenomenon in a very simple way. But uh, it's a, a type of analysis for a broad uh, first um, uh, first mm. analysis. Can I ask you, when you, as you did this, you know, and I know you spent a long time writing more about it and expanding on it and so on, I suppose my question would be, where did that take you and at what point, if you like, did, did you stop? Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, and uh, I hope to uh, start again in a sense. Yeah. And, the, and the question is good and the answer is simple. It took me away from physics because yeah. there was no way that I could really concentrate mm. on uh, my thesis when I had this explosion going on in my head. So I had to recognize that I was no longer really doing the theoretical mm. nuclear physics. I was spending my time in the library going from one section to the other, sociology, philosophy, um, all kinds of things. And so, uh, first of all, it took me away from physics. So I had to recognize that, to be honest. Mm. I went to my supervisor, Professor Elliot, and said, look, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested in something else now. Yeah. And yeah. he was very helpful, saying, well, let's try and find a department, social mm. sciences, or something mm. that um, you could carry on, you know, with the mm. funding, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so I tried half-heartedly to find people that might be interested in mm. the sort of thing, but I failed. And I didn't try hard enough, really, mm. when, it looked, when it comes back to me. So it took me away from um, my academic career. Uh, so much so that I, I think I went on the dole for a, a period because all I wanted to do was spend time yeah, yeah. Uh, reading um, sociology as much as anything else uh, to see if anybody else had uh, yeah. thought something yeah. like this, right? Yeah. Um, and so I was half hoping to find someone who had the same idea and half hoping to be original, you know, so, uh, and, and to not find it. So yeah. it's a very exciting yeah. period. And we knew each other at Did you that find time. somebody? Not really, no. Um, but uh, the very... Uh, process of, of looking and, and so on takes you into new areas yeah, yeah. and so uh, leads you towards things that you hadn't expected basically which is the the delight of uh, this this kind of activity and which still delights me and uh, motivates me is that you you think you're looking for something and you are looking for something but then you find something else mm -hmm. and it takes you in a slightly different direction but without losing sight of the original mm -hmm. aims. Uh, so it took me away from physics, and so there was this interim period where I realized that uh, I was trying to express these ideas, possibly to you, to, to, to Andy, um, but to other people that I, I met around, around the time. And I, it seemed to me that there was a huge problem here, because um, for however much I felt that this was a strong, important idea or way of looking at things, mm -hmm didn't mean anything if you couldn't express it, if you couldn't communicate it or share it in some way or uh, take it on. Uh, I had some idea of that, but I didn't know what to do. Uh, and so it seemed to me it was a question of communication. How do you um, make something interesting, uh, which at first sight seems sort of not very interesting or off 
offbeat, off, of mm. course. Mm. And so I had this brilliant idea that what I needed to do next was a year of uh, PGCE, Postgraduate Certificate of Education, yep. to do a year to uh, learn how to teach, mm. because I was going mm. to teach the world mm. uh, how to uh, model um, social analysis on physical theories mm. and so on. Mm. So it was a huge task I was setting myself and how to go about it. You know, obviously, I'm saying it tongue in cheek now, but I took it fairly seriously at the time. Uh, so it took me towards the PGCE course in Sussex University, uh, which, as I say, I was looking for something and found something quite different. Yeah. Um, I never really thought I was going to be a serious teacher. But that course took you in the classroom. Yes, that course took me in the classroom. Yeah. It wasn't only theoretical, yeah. but it was useful because there was uh, sociology and psychology and uh, mm. some history um, in, in the course, the theoretical part. Um, but then how to teach mathematics yeah. to reluctant learners and uh, how to manage uh, classroom situations and so on. Um, which, for all my exhibitionism and enjoying standing up in front of a uh, number of people and so on, um, I had to learn and wasn't very good at. You know, I wasn't actually a very good teacher. And I realised that. Um, went on to the practical experience in Bethnal Green, East, East London, yeah. Stepney, uh, where you were thrown into the deep end with uh, you know, children who had really no interest in learning mathematics and no expectations of passing exams or anything. And uh, also the um, ethnic uh, question of integration and uh, you know, inner mm -hmm. London mm -hmm. or East, mm -hmm. East London uh, social tensions and so on. And there I met uh, three or four fellow students that we shared a house with in, in Bethnal Green um, from very different backgrounds. Mm. Um, and so we shared this experience together. So we'd go out drinking and talking mm. about classroom experience. And they introduced me when mm. I would start spouting forth after a few mm. pints, because at the time I did drink quite a lot, actually, beer. And uh, so we'd get into late night conversations about all sorts of things. And Mario in particular mm. was very up on his history and uh, uh, social sciences, he taught history. Mm. Uh, and so I found myself um, lost for words. I mean, I didn't know anything about what they were talking about, you know, economics and history yeah. And, yeah. and sociology and so on. And so they knew something about uh, Marxism and mm. uh, the, the, the left wing um, doctrines of, of the day, if you like. And they introduced me to uh, Bob Young, basically, in a roundabout sort of way. They said, well, you should read these articles. Mm. And so I said, OK, fair enough. Because I was, I was looking for someone who had some interest in this question of mm. analogies between science, uh, between science and society. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And anyway, so the Radical Science Journal was that, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not exactly what I was looking for, but um, it was a radical criticism of uh, science in modern society which went beyond the use and abuse model, which was in vogue at the time, late 60s and 70s, which said, well, science is there in its pure world, and it can be either used for good ends or bad ends, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's a question of social responsibility and, okay, the discovery of the atom and um, mm. uh, splitting the atom and so on is neutral. Mm. The question is what use you make of it. And that was the, the standard use-abuse model. The Radical Science Journal, the Radical Science Movement, uh, went beyond that. It was radical in the sense that saying that um, uh, science and technology is a social uh, project. Uh, it doesn't exist outside of society. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just a question of use and abuse, mm -hmm. but the very structure, the very um, essence. thought essence, yeah. the, uh, thought processes mm -hmm. and so on, are socially constructed. Yeah, I guess it is. So, you know, who finances the research? I mean, good, good. And yeah. when does uh, when do we have techno <coughs> technological quantum leaps <coughs> during wars? No? I mean, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so everything's the, connected. Let's say. Exactly. But, but the thing I is that, that technicians do it just for the <coughs> sake of it. You say yes, just yeah. because they love technology, because they yeah. want to understand the world, the science, uh, independently from the world itself, yes. mm -hmm. whereas the, uh, the society mm -hmm. wants to have a, um, I mean, there are interests. Uh, in yeah, yeah interests, interests, yeah. interests. Yeah. So in a sense, the use-abuse model 
takes that on board, saying that there are interests, the um, military industrial complex mm. and so on has interest in financing certain projects and so on. The Radical Science Project went further, saying that science is social relations. This was the f fundamental article that Bob Young wrote, um, which I was absolutely amazed by. Um, he uh, quoted some uh, pass famous passages from Marx, who I'd never read and mm. never been particularly interested in. Apart from here at, K uh, at um, Woodroffe, Steve Evemey pointed me out the uh, Manifesto of the Communist Party, mm -hmm. which I read with interest but didn't go beyond that. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, this article, Science is Social Relations, um, opened my eyes because he wrote in a very convinced and um, enthusiastic mm -hmm. way, a non-academic way, and he put in these quotations, famous quotations from Marx, substituting uh, uh, an important oh, word. Okay. And instead of commodity, uh, uh, Bob Young put so, uh, scientific fact. Mm. And so uh, he's saying scientific facts are produced and consumed and exchanged in social circumstances. It was very impressed by the way he wrote, and it led me to want to read Marx. Mm. Said, Marx wrote that? Mm. Uh, and so I painstakingly uh, started reading Das Kapital in English, Capital, uh, the first volume, um, with this arrogant expectation that I could read anything if I wanted to. And so if I could understand theoretical nuclear physics, figurati, no, excuse the <laughs> Italian, there's a good word in Italian, figurati, which means, uh, I don't know how to translate figurati, which is like, uh, well, obviously, obviously. <laughs> naturally, I would be able to understand <clears throat> Marx. Uh, but of course, I found it hard going and, and, and rather dry and difficult. Yeah, yeah. But um, it open my eyes because uh, of this uh, concept that um, uh, the uh, social relations were not fixed, uh, mm -hmm. that there is a sense of history, that um, the way things are produced and distributed in society, okay, you start from the division of labour, which mm -hmm. if you like is neutral and everybody can agree with, uh, but um, the, the, the society has moved on from agricultural, uh, from hunter-gathering mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. agricultural, which was one revolution, from agricultural to mercantile mm -hmm. uh, economies. And so this huge rise of uh, uh, commerce. Uh, so you then developed um, the, the presuppositions, the, the bases, for modern production, and so you had the Industrial Revolution. It's, it's, it's common, common knowledge that uh, there have been these mm. uh, developments, if mm. you like, in, in mm. the, the ways of production. And uh, so Marx was looking at, about, uh, looking at the particular form of production, which is capitalist production, uh, which is not eternal. You know, mm. it didn't exist in the past and doesn't have to doesn't continue like it. that in the future. Mm. And so this basically historical way of looking mm. at um, economic, political uh, theory, uh, practice, which is new to me mm. because I, I'd been brought up with uh, uh, science and mathematics as something out there which you discover and you explain mm. and it's eternal, basically. Mm. Uh, whereas uh, this question of uh, production and distribution seemed to me, uh, it was obvious that there was a historical development and that um, capitalist production uh, was not eternal, not the be all and, and, and end all, and so the question of mm. alternatives mm. and uh, interests and so on. But anyway, it's not for me to uh, give a lesson on, on, on Marxism, just to say that I got to that in a yeah. very theoretical yeah. way. Yeah. By no means uh, a yeah. practical or social interest, it was very, very theoretical uh, from my, my point of view of interest, which took me on to Gramsci. Uh, Bob Young himself and the Radical Science Collective were very much influenced by um, the various left-wing mm -hmm. writers and, and thinkers. And um, so I was led on to uh, read uh, the English translation of uh, Gramsci's prison notebooks, right. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lawrence White Wishart edition, which is very famous, 1971. 
Gramsci was in prison during um, fascism. That's right. Yeah. Years. Yeah. And this uh, explains. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And you get to this about la uh, la late uh, 70s. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm talking about 77 now, 77, yeah. 78, when I was really uh -huh. interested in this. Mm. Uh, and so I, I went up to London from Brighton mm. uh, to join in a couple of times the uh, collectives, the, mm. the uh, sitting around cross legged on his sitting room floor uh, discussing not only science but technology and medicine mm, yeah. they were very interested yeah. in um, the medical profession as objectifying mm. uh, people uh, as opposed to um, considering social relations and it's, it was a very wide movement not only science but technology and medicine uh, considered from um, uh, a social point of view so this was taking me a long way from uh, the physics and the, mm. the pure uh, interest in the interaction analogies um, and Gramsci opened my eyes to the idea of hegemony, which is a good Italian word, hegemonia, which probably wasn't original, probably uh, Gramsci, uh, nobody comes from yeah. nothing. You know, everybody comes from some uh, background, some uh, influences and, and so on. Uh, but he developed this concept of um, uh, social hegemony as being fundamental to understanding power structures in Western Europe in particular. Um, having lived through the experience of the Russian Revolution, yeah. mm. and Gramsci went to Moscow and was mm -hmm. very much involved in mm. the discussion uh, mm. between um, uh, Trotsky, Stalin, after Lenin's death, mm. uh, at the time of the rise of fascism. So it was a tremendously uh, explosive uh, moment that Gramsci was living through. And I, I immediately realized that this was a first-rate thinker, uh, but not a, he wasn't a... An academic, he mm. was very much mm. involved with what he called praxis, which yeah. was the uh, fusion of theory and practice. Mm. Um, and this concept of hegemony is the easiest concept of his, uh, which says that um, power uh, can't be um, maintained through force alone, mm. through physical force alone. Uh, that. Um, uh, capitalism would have to be maintained by consensus, basically, that uh, the, the l large consensus of, of opinion was that it was natural and uh, common sense, basically, that the, 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 the world that we were living in, it was common sense that it was that way. Mm. Uh, and so um, the capitalist um, uh, uh, relationships between uh, uh, employers and employees mm owners of factories or owners of capital mm. and uh, workers who have only their time to sell, uh, those relationships uh, had to be increasingly considered as natural, mm. uh, which was very much the um, raison d'etre of the uh, radical science movement, that um, uh, science has developed by common sense. It's common sense that the world exists, that the earth goes round the sun. The last uh, 400 years. Yeah, and so that uh, what, what has <laughs> taken 400 years to develop uh, has become has been more sense. than a thousand well, years of uh, exactly. only religious and it still yeah. is. Okay, yeah. I mean. and, and that's a weak point, if you like. The weak point of the radical science uh, movement and so on was, uh, it was uh, vanguard, uh, um, Dan was ah. using the word vanguard, which is our word, avanguardia. Okay. La vanguardia. Mm -hmm. uh, the which movement, is, which is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it comes from the military mm -hmm. experience. Uh, the military experience where you have those who go ahead to scout the land mm. and are ahead of the uh, the main forces and then you have the main forces mm. and then you have the rear guard mm. okay so there was the vanguard mm. the ah. main forces and the rear guard uh, and so the radical science movement was very much uh, a vanguard movement la vanguardia uh, looking to the future completely forgetting about the rear guard and not realizing that the religious fundamentalisms and this what we considered common sense of the enlightenment and so on was actually being attacked mm. from behind by uh, an insurgence of um, religious fundamentalism mm. which at our time was Christian fundamentalism. Uh, we had very little idea of Islamic fundamentalism yeah. which was yeah. what we're living in through at uh, the moment. But um, uh, so the weakness of this vanguard movement was uh, completely to um, disregard the uh, insert mm. resurgence mm. of old um, religious mm. uh, authoritarian mm. 
uh, ways of looking at the world. But did this movement feel that capitalism was the right... I mean, you talked about common sense. Did they feel that, that was the right way to do things? Rosemary, I haven't explained anything, have I? <laughs> <laughs> no! no. Uh, no, the radical science movement was anti-capitalist, absolutely, yeah. saying that we need to go beyond uh, this uh, outmoded capitalist mode of production. Were they referring then to um, commun Soviet communism? Well, that's the, 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 the sore point. That's the sore point. Socialism because uh, we labelled ourselves, if you like, as, as communist extreme left-wingers, which you know, doesn't really help very much and so you're defending yourself mm, then mm. against Stalinism because that's the, it yeah, yeah and so the the no the, the radical science movement and the manifesto in Italy yeah, jumping ahead yeah. were radically critical of uh, the authoritarian derivative as mm. they said of mm. Stalinism and uh, and Maoism mm. and uh, even uh, what was happening in Cuba although Cuba was considered uh, more it was closer to mm. the, uh, the type of model that we were interested in. No, uh, what was wanted was uh, more participation, uh, the, a more sense of uh, involvement in, in the community. Uh, so Gramsci, excuse me if I, if I just carry on for a minute, uh, Gramsci's great contribution practically in Turin, which is one of the reasons, or the main reason, why I, I went to Turin apart from the personal factors, uh, they set up in the early 20s mm. uh, workers' councils, mm. which uh, yeah. you know, were called Soviets yeah, in the Soviet yeah, Union, yeah. Uh, where um, there would be workers' councils which would then elect representatives to uh, in industry-wide um, uh, uh, bodies, uh, which would then be integrated with territorial-based integration. So using the Soviet model mm. uh, to uh, go beyond liberal democracy, uh, representative parliamentary democracy, to participative democracy, where uh, the uh, productive workers uh, were actively involved in economic decisions mm. and social uh, decisions. Mm. Right? Yeah, I think this works uh, perfect in an ideal world, then you, but you start uh, taking for granted that the community is a uh, uh, mature enough to... Yes, okay, which right, brings us back to Woodrow in a sense, which is something which I, I should have I, learned when I was 17 years old, that to the theory is one thing. No, 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 but I mean, <laughs> but, uh, for sure, we um, uh, want to uh, uh, follow, uh, I mean, 100 people, 90 uh, people would uh, uh, um, go for the easiest way, quite, which is quite. Yes. follow the leaders yes. rather than participating yes. itself yes. because it's yes. not yes. easy expressing yes. Yes. and so this I mean, this vanguard movement uh, would recognize that but obviously wasn't capable of translating that into practice to um, motivate the 90 people who weren't particularly interested to become interested if you like so it was a question of education a question mm. of uh, communication and uh, uh, explaining mm. that basically the next step, the higher level of maturity and uh, participation, uh, yeah. required more effort, not less. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I will find. Uh, um, I will be more motivated to participate if I will find that uh, I'm losing freedom or if I'm not getting to the end of the month. I mean, mm. if yeah, things are not so good, but I have my iPhone, I have uh, my. TV movie. I'm, I'm mm. being very, how do you say, yeah. not very intellectual, but practical. Yeah. And so this is Gramsci's hegemony that uh, Ford understood this mm. um, in, in the States, that if you give even your, your workers enough money, you know... Even the Romans. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. not discovering anything particularly new here, but uh, there was this... Uh, strong desire to go beyond uh, this form of production, which uh, was disastrous because we lived through the, the wars and Gramsci himself was living through the fascist period and we went into the Second World War, uh, which then brings us to the economic question of the Great Depression in the 30s and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, there was this tremendous energy uh, to say... Capitalism isn't the be-all and end-all. It's not the end of history. Mm. Uh, and so to propose other more advanced models, but we didn't understand sufficiently 
the resistance, the, the, the strength of the hegemony, the, the strength of uh, strength the, the indifference, the strength of the establishment yeah. and the tendency to take the easiest uh, course of action, which, as you say, is to let other people get on with it, you know, uh, just to, to follow the leaders, basically. Uh, so yeah, and was the time right? No, the question. The, sorry. Yeah, was the time right? Uh, well, evidently the not. You were suggesting. Evidently not. The time. Evidently yeah. not. I think what's interesting here again is about the history that we've worked through, where eighty nine, if you like, capitalism won because the Soviet Union lost, so, so that gave a big boost. But then two thousand and eight, actually, capitalism falls apart. Good, and that brings me on to about the and that, that um, takes you there. because uh, so then. Going on from that, mm. I, I want to get to the last chapter, as it were, the last stage, which is uh, economics. Uh, now, having um, been very enthusiastic about uh, quantum mechanics field theory, and particularly differential equations in Cambridge, uh, I was amazed to find that not only was there, there this um, interaction analogy, but um, economics was written in the same language. Yeah. Economics is written in mathematics, you know, and it made me laugh to mm. see some of the um, uh, fundamental equations which use the same symbols, uh, like P for prices, mm. whereas we use P for momentum mm. in uh, the, the uh, equations of um, price and demand, supply and demand, and, and price levels and equilibrium. In fact, the, the word equilibrium mm. was mm. fundamental. Uh, which then took me on uh, to read Keynes, uh, yeah. the, the general yeah. theory of employment, money and interest, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And in fact, I've just ordered now, when I get back to Italy, I should have a copy of the, ec the, the, mechanisms of, the Mechanism of Economic Systems by Arnold Tustin, who was a, an, an English engineer, who was uh, pointing out the analogies, mm. analogies mm -hmm. between electricity electronic systems or electrical systems mm. and economics. Mm. Ah. Um, Keynes was considered a, a revolutionary, uh, he revolutionized uh, classical uh, economics because he came up with this very simple idea of the multiplier um, of um, investment, uh, the governments uh, investing in, mm. in major works to stimulate the economy mm. and he called it pump priming. Yeah. Basically, uh, no, none of us here is, is old enough to remember, as my mother remembers, what it means to prime a pump. Mm. I don't know whether your family had a pump at the farm, probably not, but my, my mother did, where you had the pump, and to get it to start, you had to pour water down it. To, so you had to feed into it a certain amount of water to get the, to get water, the water to come up, yeah. okay? Yeah. So there was this mechanism of priming the pump. Mm. And in fact, uh, Keynes used the metaphor of priming the pump, pump priming, uh, to stimulate the economy. Yeah. So uh, if the government poured some money into some projects, mm -hmm. it would uh, create employment, which would mm. create demand, mm. which the, would the uh, stimulate the, the uh, production. Mm. And so you would get the economy moving again. And this was mm. in the context of the Great Depression. Mm. And so he revolutionized uh, economic thinking, also using his mathematics. But I was less impressed by that than by Irving Fisher. Irving Fisher uh, wrote uh, an important work in the early 20s, whose name I forget, which I, th I think it was just called Mathematical Economics or mm. an Investigation mm. of uh, Mathematical Economics, where he started uh, 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 postulating mathematical equations uh, using field theory when it came down to it, mm. Uh, I was fascinated to see uh, the div and grad operators, which you may remember. Um, uh, div and grad, <laughs> <laughs> which you remember, uh, uh, which we used for differential operators, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, talking in terms of um, yeah, uh, value and prices. Okay, so uh, he was using this mathematical language in a very open way, saying uh, the uh, economic system is uh, very intricate mm. and not half enough people have uh, an understanding of the physics uh, which we can use to explain equilibrium, mm. you know, because e equilibrium is a, a physical concept, mm. but economic equilibrium makes sense, okay? Yeah, but uh, physically you, uh, you can use these operators, but uh, starting from 
Strong hypothesis. Strong hypothesis. The system must be homogeneous. The good. system must be uh, conservative. Physics, uh, conservative, and so yeah, yeah good, physics good. is quite uh, not 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 easy. I mean, in physics, um, in economics, uh, people are involved. No. Okay. Uh, Which brings in indeterminate factors, yes. if you like, yeah. and it gets much more complicated. And so this brings me, we're practically there now. The, the last week, last Thursday, I went to hear Yanis Varoufakis <coughs> give this uh, um, acceptance speech for his honorary uh, doctorate at the uh, University of Turin. His speech was entitled Democracy in Europe, but in fact uh, uh, he was um, illustrating in a very simple sort of way his uh, criticism of uh, modern um, political economics mm. and, and saying we need to resuscitate, uh, revive the concept of uh, um, critical uh, uh, criticism of uh, p political economics, which is what Marx mm. was writing. Yeah. He called capital uh, a critique of political e economics. Um, uh, saying basically the foundations, uh, the assumptions, the strong hypotheses of uh, economics are wrong. Mm. Uh, they are based on the assumption that crises can't exist. And so you know, when you find yourself in a crisis, uh, the, all the economic tools that you have are, are based on uh, theories and equations and, and structures which explicitly um, uh, leave out the possibility of, uh, of crises because um, uh, they're all deterministic equations that economics is only accepted, uh, class, or neoclassical economics, uh, is only accepted into the mainstream if it produces deterministic uh, results. And he says that isn't the case in uh, modern society uh, because um, there are strong correlations. It's very simple when it comes down to it. Uh, why was the, the, the crisis in yeah. 2008? Yeah. Uh, uh, because there were these derivative products, the financial exactly. products, yeah. which were based mm. on the assumption on the that assumption. The, the correlation between mm. bust and the risk mm. of him going bust at the same time were negligible. Mm. It's not true. If, mm. if you go bust, mm. then he's, oh, I, I better cut back, mm. I better be a bit more careful. So he mm. produces less, and so which, mm. so, which mm. I, I increases the, the mm. depth of the recession. But the ir irony of this is that actually it was the physicists and mathematicians working in the city, in the finance firms, that actually created these equations and worked them through the computers that created the crash. Right, right. So you, it, it's interesting where the science... Uh, yeah, well, the, those of us who have had the, the, uh, the privilege of uh, reading some of the maths and, and being able to, to read the language, yeah. if you like, Varoufakis himself, mm. myself, hopefully, yeah. Mirovsky, there's another uh, 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 American who's important to me, Philip Mirovsky, who's also criticising neoliberalism. So I, I just referred to Philip Mirovsky, who I read well before um, Varoufakis, and I'm not sure that they know of each other, uh, but they're in a sense uh, talking at, on different planes, but similar things. Mirovsky, back uh, 10 years ago or so, wrote something called um, More Heat Than Light, uh, where he was uh, criticizing neoliberalism just from this point of view. As, as Luca was saying, there are strong assumptions in economic yeah. equations. As you say, the physicists and mathematicians yeah. Uh, that have been uh, developing the economic theories have uh, assumed that the economic world is pretty much like the physical world, if you like, uh, whereas uh, there are important differences. Uh, and so the, uh, the, 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 the fundamentals don't really stand up. Uh, in particular, uh, from my point of view, uh, the, the question of conservation. The, the, all that we've done in physics is based on the conservation of energy. Yeah. Since Leibniz and Newton... Uh, quantum mechanics, relativity and so on, is all um, based on the uh, idea that there are certain uh, quantities which are conserved and then there are transformations and so the concept of energy is, is fundamental. Uh, and uh, the economists, in a sense, have taken over that vision but they don't have a clear correspondence of what is energy. In a sense, the energy of an economic system makes sense. You know, how... how um, uh, productive, how uh, strong an economy is. There's a sense of it being energetic or having more or less energy. But what does that mean in in in, uh, in practical terms? Um, uh, and so, there's, in a sense, you, you want a conservation of something, which it's it's hard to find. Mm. A conservation of value, a conservation of um, 
economic energy, uh, because without that, you don't have deterministic solutions. And what I want to read now of uh, uh, Varoufakis is more on this uh, concept of indeterminacy. Um, and within the financial institutions, uh, there, there's this strong sense that Varoufakis is developing of surpluses and deficits. Mm -hmm. There are the surplus uh, producing countries, uh, which used to be the United States mm -hmm. uh, up until mm -hmm. 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States were, was a, a, a major uh, surplus producing country um, and uh, financed uh, the development of Germany and, and uh, uh, Japan and so on. And, but since 1971, that's been reversed, that uh, uh, the, the states has become a net uh, borrower. Mm. Uh, the the, the na national debt of the United States has uh, increased incredibly. So who's producing the surpluses? Well, uh, Germany to some extent, China, China. Okay, yeah. and, and the uh, emerging e economies, because mm. this, in, uh, this mechanism encouraged uh, the creation of toxic products. He uses the word toxic all the time, which is another metaphor, mm. Mm. which is a mixed metaphor, which mm. needs looking at. Uh, where um, debt was produced in what seems to be a risk-free system. There, mm, there was this mm. economic engineering of financial products which seems to avoid all risks. So you could uh, produce this paper, these bonds, these um, um, debts uh, ad infinitum. Uh, but of course the bubble burst because mm. this, this created a huge bubble of um, uh, debt. Yeah, rationally speaking, was it something working? Of course not, but because uh, rationally speaking means uh, thinking about the community, uh, thinking about the good of every, everybody, no? Mm. Um, of course, with these toxic products, products. and uh, derivatives and so, mm. few people made interests of few, few people. Yeah, and not quite, of the okay, which community. is the capitalist yeah. uh, structure, that, that's which what is capitalism not is. not something which happened uh, happens in, of course, in physical systems, because uh -huh. there is only objective systems, I don't know how to say. But there are sources and sinks, and so uh, yeah, basically well, this is what I want to come to, is that there, there, there are other models mm. to look at which mm. might be useful yeah. uh, for criticizing to start yeah, with, yeah. Uh, to, to look at the, the, the circuits of the economy, mm. uh, because uh, this is a whole mm. area which we haven't got time to go into, which I want to, to look at again. Economics, um, uh, after the Second World War and so on, increasingly was interested in control mechanisms mm. uh, of uh, the government uh, being able to control the supply of money mm. and levels of investment, interest rates and mm. so on. There were these various tools to control uh, the d development of inflation and uh, production and so on. And there was the, co the sense of control, which the book I'm about to re read again, Arnold Tustin, says, ah, well, that's just like what I know in mm. uh, uh, electrical systems, yeah. okay, mm. control system, feedback, feed mm. forward. Mm. Uh, and so I want to take that up again as a possible model uh, for good or for bad. Mm. And w in, in a sense, um, we're at the end of the discussion now, basic discussion, my exposition, because I left all that behind because I was quite frightened by it um, that I could see all these possibilities uh, but the most likely outcome, in my opinion, was that it would be misused. You know, if I were to say, well, let's look at modeling mm, the economy yeah. on electronics and amplifiers mm. and, and, and so on, uh, someone would say, yeah, great, okay, uh, so we can make the economy work better with that. And I didn't want, I don't want to make the capitalist economy work better. I want to go beyond it uh, uh, to I. Uh, I, I feel mm. that history sh should develop to a more responsible uh, system, because um, uh, financial capitalism in particular, capitalism in general, is irresponsible. Uh, it's uh, only based on uh, interest and optimization, if you like. Uh, whereas uh, I, I, I want to consider democratic control of taking responsibility for what kind of activity we promote or uh, in, inhibit. Uh, which is a, a tremendously uh, ta uh, taxing uh, question. So uh, Dan was urging us to get to the stage of what next or the future or where do we want to go. And basically that's it. Uh, I want to encourage somehow 
uh, the possibility of an age of responsibility mm. to move beyond the present age of capitalism to an age of responsibility where we rationally uh, decide, we socially uh, uh, responsibly decide what kind of society mm. we want to do, which is not based on the laws of the economy, as if the economy was out there mm. like a physical system, mm. which you control in some sense, but which anyway is impervious mm. to democratic decision making. Uh, so that's, if you like, my um, moral, philosophical uh, desire. Mm. Uh, but of course, th there's no, what should I say, uh, there's, there's no guarantee that that's the right thing to do. There's no reason, uh, fundamentally, why anybody else uh, should think that mm. that's the right thing to do. It requires persuasion, mm. which is democracy, which mm. is uh, being human. Uh, but I, I certainly want to criticise um, um, this... Uh, view of the world which takes as common sense the fact that there is an economy there which is governed by mathematical equations which you can't do anything about when it comes down to or, or you can t t uh, tinker with and, and maybe make work. Varoufakis is more realistic than mm. me in this mm. that here he recognises that there is a moral imperative again to avoid mm. barbarism, to avoid mm. slipping back into uh, uh, crises which we, we can't foresee Mm. You know, there are some people that have always said the worse things are, the better. You know, the, the extreme yes, left yeah. wingers would say yeah, yeah. The, the, the sooner we destroy capitalism, the yeah. better. Better to destroy it all and start again. Yeah. Uh, so the worse things are, the better. Uh, Varoufakis is much more um, phlegmatic, if you like, in that sense. Mm. No, um, we don't want to destroy the European Union. We don't want to destroy capitalism at the moment uh, because it's too disastrous. Mm. We have to help make it work. Like. Keynes did basically, mm. so we do need to collaborate with uh, the capitalists and so on at the moment. Mm. But um, there has to be this long-term uh, idea that history doesn't end like that, uh, that, it, that things can be better. And it requires much more effort, it requires uh, persuading people uh, that it's a good idea to go along to meetings, to the me condominium meetings, which I need to go to when I go back, to take part mm. in decision making, not delegate, mm. not leave it to other other, other people, mm. which means participative mm. democracy as opposed to um, uh, parliamentary mm. uh, delegating uh, responsibility. So that's that's where I want yeah. to go. That history in, uh, teaches that. If an idea can go wrong, it will, and badly, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? Yeah. What I like about that is, is you were talking about the fact that things could be better. And that, for me, echoes, if you like, what was happening here when you were 17 and wanting things to be better. So I still see that, that drive and that ambition for a better world. Hmm. I think all of us have been knocked back by things, particularly like 2008, um, and, and the realisation that actually not everybody does want a better world for everyone. Mm. And the establishment is stronger than any of us mm. understood. Mm. 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 Uh, there are lots of people who are simply gaming the system mm. un, un, as long as they can get away with it. Um, and that it's going to be incredibly hard yes. to, to communicate and bring people on board. Yes. Uh, and the, the key factor for me, and we started talking about it again in terms of the sixth form, is leadership. Mm. And it's whether or not we have the leadership now and in the next 20 years uh, that will help us to do this. Mm -hmm. I, I feel we're living through a time of very weak leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whatever you might be able to write or to contribute, which you were trying to do all those years ago, mm -hmm. can we bring that in? So we actually have mm -hmm. the leaders who might take us forward mm -hmm. to, to this better place. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly I'm impressed by this Varoufakis who uh, says he wakes up in the morning thinking democracy. Um. He's Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, but I don't know. I, I feel in a sense that I've, uh, I've wasted a lot of time. I know that. Uh, personally, uh, maybe I, I should have been more enthusiastic and done more earlier. But... I made my decision to uh, to live life and to have a family and to uh, uh, not be uh, tempted by the academic world to um, uh, to stay in university and to actually you know 
uh, experience uh, working life and the experience of standing up on with a mm. megaphone mm. on a table mm. and speaking mm. in Italian mm. with a strong English accent mm. to uh, mm. two or three hundred colleagues mm. um, was a, a very important experience mm. and I have no regrets personally yeah. but I do feel in a sense that I'm um, it's, it's, it's time that I started on my third life um, to put back something for all the all that I've had from life so far. Well, you I think you've done a lot of thinking, which most of us haven't done. And not much right. acting. <laughs> no, you've done some acting as well. Mm. But you've done a lot of thinking and you're very clear about where you've been going. Mm. And that's remarkable, mm. you know. Mm. And it does all link together, as, as Rosemary's been saying. It does link back to things that happened in this building. Mm -hmm. So, good. Well, yeah. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Good. Privilege. Anyway, th this this conversation, I would like us to continue yeah, at my place in yep. uh, in uh, in uh, Italy because that's a whole other aspect. And the weather is much better. And the weather <laughs> <Exactly>. is better. <okay. laughs>